Hello and welcome to WTO Forum. Today's topic, regional trade agreements. Are they stepping stones or obstacles to a more effective global trading system? Today, we're fortunate to have with us two noted experts on this topic. Jagdish Bhagwati, professor at Columbia University and at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Gary Huffbauer of the Peterson Institute of International Economics in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much. Jagdish, if I could start with you, are regional trade agreements compatible with a global trading system? Well, in principle, <clears throat> they are, because there's Article 24 in the GATT and now in the WTO, in which we allow for uh, free trade agreements and customs unions to, to go through. Uh, the problem at the moment is that they've proliferated on such an enormous scale that they have become very much uh, uh, a systemic problem right now for the World Trade Organization. Uh, I think most people do realize that the scale to which they've grown, they're about 400 right now, that large amounts of world trade is now going through <coughs> Uh, through these agreements, which actually deny the most favored nation clause, which is about non-discriminatory handling of trade. So that is one thing which worries a lot of people. It's, it's been, you know, I've called it the spaghetti bowl problem in the sense of lots of crisscrossing tariffs, rules of origin, because you could try to identify which product is whose, and that gets very complicated. And I think a lot of people are yearning for simplicity, which is really what you would get uh, with the MFN treatment in the WTO. So while it's legal, WTO compatible historically, mm. uh, it is not, it's something that's gotten out of hand. Mm. And I think a lot of people are worried about it now. And you know, the whole question is now, what do we do about them? How do we make them more compatible, uh, if at all it's possible, with the World Trade Organization? Uh, and many people are also worried about the effects of these very complicated arrangements with a literally hundreds of um, rules which are all you know preferential how do the small countries and the sm you know the small corporations deal with this chaotic structure so many developing country people uh, trade ministers are worried about the downside for the developing countries because the big corporations can get around there are MBAs and you know I mean they're worried about it but they can surmount it uh, it would just adds to the cost of production, why I have to worry about all this. But it's not something which stops them in their tracks. Gary, do the developing countries face disadvantages in a system like this? I want to go back to first principles because I have a little bit different take than Jagdish, as you might expect. And as Jagdish, I know, knows. <laughs> the whole purpose of all this uh, trade system is to lower barriers, to get tariffs down, to get other barriers down. Now, we've known since Adam Smith that the best way to do that is unilaterally. But we also know from political economy that countries have a hard time doing it just on their own. Um, and so that's why we have the GATT and the WTO. So each country can trade its barriers for the other country's barriers. That's already a step away from the best. That's good, but it's not the best, which is unilateral. Now, the, all these regional trade agreements are just one further step towards recognizing the political reality and uh, preferential trade agreements, free trade agreements, whatever you want to call them. Um, they enable a couple of countries, two, three, four, however many, to really get those barriers way down to zero in many cases, as has happened in Europe, as has happened in NAFTA and some other agreements. And, um, you know, you have to ask, what's wrong with that? We're, the big goal is to get the barriers down, and these get the barriers down. They do it a lot faster than the WTO or the GATT has been able to do it. They go a lot further. They go into areas like services and investment, which the WTO has not been able to do, uh, and they go to zero, as I, as I emphasize. Now, what's wrong with it is exactly what Jagdish has emphasized, but I have to put the shoe on the other foot. The, the wrong is this explosion, this proliferation, as he's correctly said, there are about <clears throat> 350 or 400 now in existence. And there have been more in the last 10 years than in the previous 10 years and so on. What's the cause of that? The cause of that is the very stalemated situation in the WTO. And that's where countries are turning who want to liberalize and get the benefits of trade. 
including many developing countries. So I finally come back to your question. This is the way they get there quickest. This is the turnpike method. And um, it's not the best, but it's sure better than keeping those barriers up at the sky. Further and faster through regional agreements? It didn't used to be faster, uh, like the Chile one with the United States. It took lo lo almost twice as long as the Uruguay round, which was dealing with a great range of issues. Now it's quickened, that's for sure, because once people learn how to do these things, uh, some templates get established and so on. So I think they've, they've grown. Though there's an enormous growth of all kinds of templates also. I think one of the reasons why that some of the developing countries have gone in for these is not because they're unhappy with the, the pace at which WTO proceeds, because in the end, we are dealing with large numbers of countries, large numbers of issues. So it's inevitable that you know the, the amount of time taken is going to increase. Uh, Tokyo round was about five years. That was the then we had the Uruguay round, which was about eight, a little short of eight. We've now on Doha gone as far as about five and a half to six. So we have another two years to go not be, before we begin to worry. But that I'm not saying we should go another two years. We are pretty <laughs> close, in my opinion, to an agreement. But I think, in a sense, this kind of feeling, which I think, uh, I mean, Gary is absolutely. Uh, telling us the sort of feeling which you have in some, you know, some among some negotiators that this is such a uh, hornet's nest, uh, the WTO. That therefore we have to go the other route. Mm. But that is, I think, over over dramatizing the slowness. In my mm. opinion, uh, even now I'm an optimist on Doha, and I think there are ways in which you could get it done, uh, and. Simply saying that we retreat into in a second best, um, you know, bilaterals and so on seems to me to be a little short sighted in terms of the impact it leaves on the system. I don't agree with um, Gary uh, that any kind of trade liberalization is good. I mean, just like any kind of tax increase is not good if you want to raise revenue, you, you worry about what kind. And I think I would say that the downsides of many of these PTAs or preferential trade agreements. I call them preferential because we have to remember these are not free trade. They're, 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 by, they're, they're, they're not multilateral free trade. They're less than that and they're preferential. So they're, they have a, they're a different kind of animal from the rest. Gary? Uh, ja uh, Jagdish is absolutely right that the time from the end of the last round to the end of the next round is getting longer and longer. And we would be lucky if this round is concluded you know, 15 years after the, uh, the Uruguay round. This is not an accident. This is not an accident. Imagine a parliament which worked on two rules. One, it had to get everything through unanimously. Mm -hmm. And two, every issue, whether it be taxes, health, roads, defense, had to be in a single undertaking, had to be in a single bill. Well, that parliament would never get any place. That's exactly the WTO system right now. Mm -hmm. 150 members, they basically all have to agree, or essentially all of them have to agree. And we've got this single undertaking which goes across a vast range of issues. Now, when you have that kind of, um, of system, you have built-in stalemate. And countries want to get the benefit of liberalization. It's beyond doubt that liberalization you know, pays enormous dividends. It's one of the best things a country can do for itself. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to wait for, uh, you know, for 13 years to do it. And uh, Jagdish is absolutely right. Chile took 13 years, but Chile did a lot of unilateral liberalization. They're, they're a virtuous country. They did a lot first. But if you take uh, U.S. Australia, that took all of two years. Jagdish, final thoughts. Well, uh, I think uh, when you deal with a number of issues, like, like in, take my university, there are 3,000 professors, all of them have a, a Senate. We get things done. We have lots of issues there. So the, within the WTO, we worked out ways in which the 150 don't matter as much because they work through groups and mm -hmm. so on, and they're natural coalitions mm -hmm. which, which get established. So I think when you think in abstract about the number of <laughs> countries mm -hmm. and so on, you're going to go the, the Gary Huffbauer route and start worrying like mad. Two, I think uh, 
the developing countries among themselves can do things uh, and are doing some of them. I mean, they're uh, a fair number now by now. But when it comes to big countries like U.S. or, or a group like EU, when they get into agreements, you know, one on one, I'm not surprised it goes through fast, <laughs> right? Because it's very uneven. It's not. It's not negotiation. It's actually a very asymmetric thing. So, and the part that really worries me, and it's the last thought, uh, is that when you're doing that, and when you take a country like the United States, which is, you know, a very responsive democracy with a whole lot of lobbying groups and so on, we manage to put in all kinds of extraneous issues, uh, which then muddy up the trade picture. And my worry is that a lot of developing countries are in when the, with EU or US, and particularly US, which is much more responsive, uh, that you are actually signing on to a variety of things uh, which are going to remain with you. And the preferential ad advantage you have in the American market is one which is going to erode over time. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. more, because Doha is bound to succeed, there'll be another round. So I think the developing countries are the ones I really worry about uh, much more. Uh, first, because of the spaghetti bowl problem, and two, the signing on to things. And in aid, we have learned that you know, if you get a somebody calls it an aid program, and when you actually are pay, you know, you're being ripped off. Uh, <laughs> we have learned that. So now, with trade, we have to, to again be sense, you know, be careful. What are you buying into? It looks like you're okay. getting entry into the U.S. market, but you know, it will go through fast, right? But I think. Uh, caveat emptor, or bar beware, is, is something that you know many developing countries are beginning to worry about now. Gary Huffbauer, you have the last word. <laughs> I, can, I just would like to make two points. Uh, I do worry about the developing countries, but I worry about the small developing countries. I think it's an outrage right now that India is one of the blocking powers in this Doha round, but India is willing to reduce its tariffs to zero in a deal with the European Union. India doesn't have a problem. I think it's, it's not benefiting the, uh, the multilateral system, but India is a, is a developing country which can take care of itself. Could I say that of Bangladesh? Probably not. The second point, and here I think Jagdish and I are absolutely in agreement, is that the regional and the multilateral system are, are both here to stay. The regionals are here to stay. Nobody thinks they're going away. And the challenge ahead, which was the challenge of this um, Two, two and a half day conference we just had is how you can mesh the regionals, how you can get over these rough edges, how you can bring in these, you know, these small developing countries and give them a fair shake. That's really the challenge of the next decade. Two different points of view on regional trade agreements. I'd like to thank our guests, Gary Huffbauer and Jagdish Bagwati. Thank and you. thanks to you for watching WTO Forum.